I am very grateful to Dr. Arya and to Professor Mueller for saying very nice things about me. In spite of all these titles which they have mentioned, I would like to take you into confidence and tell you I am no teacher. I am only a student. I am like one of you, studying yoga and meditation. As I have been able to understand, yoga and meditation are the same thing. And they mean the art of being yourself. It sounds very simple, but when we look at our own lives, we find that we are not ourselves. We have started living through the eyes, the ears, the perceptions, the minds of other people. We do not seem to have the time to look at ourselves and to be ourselves. Therefore, yoga, which means union, is the capacity to get back to oneness within your own self. There are many methods in yoga. The different methods do not change the objectives of yoga. The objective has always been to be yourself, to discover the oneness of yourself. We are so scattered in our attention, in our awareness, that to pull back the scattered awareness to our own selves seems to be a big task. It is strange that we don't find going out somewhere, making a trip a task, but we find it a task to cancel the trips and be at home. Yoga is the art of cancelling the trips that consciousness makes and just for once being at home. All method involves effort. Method means effort. And all effort is counterproductive to relaxation. Yoga is the only effort I am aware of which leads to relaxation. When we say that yogic method leads to relaxation, we draw our attention from the scattered areas of experience around ourselves, we come back to our own self and we are relaxed because we are no longer intense. To share with you my thoughts and ideas based upon association with yogis and practitioners of the art of being themselves, some of the techniques and methodology used by them, some of the more important obstacles that come in the way of being ourselves and how those obstacles are overcome. When we want to be ourselves, the first self we notice is the self with which we sit on a little bit of space upon this ground, upon this earth, upon this seat, upon this chair. We have occupied this space and we are conscious of it. We occupy space in the air, in the room, and we are conscious of it. We are conscious of the walls of this room, and if we want to know where we are, we put a question to ourselves, where are we, and we easily become aware of the floor of this room, the walls of this room, and where we are. So long as our attention is outside this room, we are nowhere near ourselves. But when we bring our attention within this room, then it becomes somewhat easier to locate where we are sitting in this room. In terms of consciousness, in terms of awareness, we are using even this body, which is the self in this room. This body is also being used to house awareness. Our consciousness is being embodied in this cage, in this room, in this building we call the physical human body. Just like we can experience ourselves sitting in this room, conscious of the walls and the floor and the ceiling of this room, so can we develop the consciousness of our conscious being sitting in this body and experiencing life within itself. Unfortunately, we don't do it. Our natural situation as conscious beings is to be in this body. But we live unnaturally by scattering ourselves through the process of scattered attention and don't come back to where we belong. Yoga is the art, meditation is the method of coming back to where you belong. When we come back to this physical body, we withdraw our attention, our scattered attention, from experiences 
outside the body. It is not easy. We have to do lots of things in order to train our scattered attention to come back. We have to unlearn the lessons we have learned of extending ourselves out in the world. We have learned those lessons of stretching ourselves out in consciousness throughout the world so long that it seems to be a hardship just to unlearn those lessons and be where we belong. When we want to come back to our physical bodies, back to our own self, we find it very hard. The association of ideas with experiences outside keep our consciousness moving out. If we lie down and go to sleep, we sometimes feel we have forgotten the experiences of the world. But unfortunately, at that time, we also forget the experiences of the physical body. Otherwise, it would be very easy to withdraw from the world by going to sleep, because then we forget the world. But in the process of forgetting the world, we also forget the physical body where we were supposed to develop our awareness, to come back to the physical body. How do we come back to the physical body and don't go to sleep? Maybe we should not sleep, keep awake, and yet have a posture of the physical body, adopt that stance in the physical body that should enable us to come back to this body in awareness. The training of human consciousness in collecting its scattered thoughts and bringing it back to one's own self is called yoga. It has several steps. Some of the more important but preliminary steps in this process are the do's and don'ts of social life. Unless we follow these do's and don'ts of our external life, it becomes very difficult to pull back attention from external life. Yogis have therefore preached and practiced certain do's and don'ts, rules of behavior, conduct, performance, which tend to make it easy to facilitate the withdrawal of attention from the external world of experience. When those do's and don'ts have been practiced and the attachments to external experience have been reduced, we then practice the art of using human attention to discover our own physical body. The whole process takes place in awareness. What is awareness? Awareness is a part of consciousness. In order to communicate with you on this technical subject of methodology, I will have to define three terms. Consciousness, awareness and attention. Consciousness is the capacity to be aware. It includes potential awareness. It includes the subconscious. It includes a forgotten event. It includes memories. It includes superconscious states. It includes any potential conscious experience. Consciousness is then potential awareness. Awareness is contemporary consciousness. Awareness is that part of consciousness which we are experiencing now and here. Whatever comes into our awareness at this moment is awareness. What can come into awareness at this moment is consciousness. Awareness then is just one slice of consciousness, just one part of consciousness. Attention is a part of awareness. It is that part of awareness where awareness has been specially focused and is intensified. Like we are conscious of the whole world, we are conscious of our families, our problems, our friends, our business. But we are aware at this moment only of this room and the meditation center. We can recall the other experiences from outside. But we are confining ourselves to the awareness of this room. You are all aware of this room and all of us sitting here. But out of this awareness of this room, you are attending to me. Your attention is on me. Attention then is a small probe. It's a small projectile, a small part of existing contemporary awareness which we move from one part of awareness to another to intensify the experience of that awareness. We can't change awareness. It is there. But we need not attend to this part or that part of awareness. 
By attending to one part of awareness, we are able to focus ourselves, able to experience in the self, in, the, in our total conscious apparatus, we are able to use a part of ourselves as attention to intensify experience of that of which we are aware. If I were to say, attend to this board over here, you would be aware of the whole room. But as you place your attention upon this board, you will get intensified awareness of this board. This capacity in human awareness to use attention enables us to manipulate awareness. There is no other part of awareness that we can manipulate, we can use as a methodology except the human attention. Therefore, all meditation is a technique of using the attention. The manner in which we use human attention constitutes the methodology of meditation. When we want to be ourselves, we want to withdraw attention from the non-self to ourselves. When we want to be our physical body, we want to withdraw attention from the experience around us to our own physical body. What we are handling, the material we are handling is our conscious attention, our attention in awareness. This attention is scattered at the moment. We don't focus it upon anything. On the other hand, by being scattered, it gets involved, knotted up in so many things. It becomes difficult even to pull it back. If we examine our daily lives, we will notice that our human attention is locked up, knotted up, involved in so many other human situations that we can't pull back. Even when we like to forget about a thing, we are so involved in it, we can't forget about it. This is because that human attention is caught up there. This human attention being caught up in a large number of situations becomes scattered. And there are some functions we perform because of this scattered state which scatter it even more. One of these functions which we perform in awareness which scatters attention and you can experience the scattering of attention is to lose temper. When we get mad, we can see the attention being scattered. And we get mad most of the time at something or the other. And every time we get mad, we can watch this capacity to concentrate, focus our attention getting scattered. To learn anything anything, in any science, in any area of knowledge, we use attention. When a little child is taught how to learn the contents of a book, when the little child's mind is on the friends, the guys playing outside, the kids outside, we insist upon the child, concentrate upon the book. What does that mean? Concentrate attention upon the book. There is nothing else to concentrate. The only thing we can concentrate is attention. When we concentrate attention upon the book, what happens? We become more intensely aware of the contents of the book and become unaware of the kids playing outside. Both these things happen together. Concentration of attention is the art of switching on and off awareness of experiences on which attention is concentrated. Now, when you read a book, you find the reading is very easy and you cover maybe four pages every ten minutes or three pages depending on your speed. You mark your speed of reading. Then you have hot words with somebody, lose your temper, get mad at somebody and come back and read the same book. Your speed is reduced to half. Why? You can't cover the same number of pages, even if you try. What has happened? You have impaired your capacity to concentrate attention by getting mad. These processes which happen in awareness in relation to the external experience of this world impair our capacity to concentrate. There are other events also. Getting mad is just one of them. One of the important things that impairs the capacity to concentrate attention 
is the subconscious involvement in a feeling of guilt. When we feel guilty, we again scatter our attention. It need not be a conscious guilt. In fact, none of us likes to feel guilty. We try to forget that we are guilty. But the guilt conscience comes back over and over again. It remains hidden in the history of mankind ever since man came upon this earth was the feeling of guilt in extinguishing life. We have been unable to accept that what we are, if that is extinguished, would be a good thing. It has been very difficult for man to accept that extinguishing of life is a good thing. And all extinguishing of life has led to a feeling of subconscious guilt. And yet the strange tragedy of the human situation is, of the entire living situation is, that life subsists only on life. Life grows by extinguishing other life. If you look at any living thing upon this earth, you will find it lives by extinguishing other life. One type of life is extinguished to create the food for another type of life. We are extinguishing life in order to feed ourselves, in order to grow, in order to live. When we extinguish life, the effect upon our subconscious is clearly reflected in the impairment of the power to concentrate attention. Those of you who have been practicing the art of meditation or those of you who have been practicing the art of concentrating attention would notice that if you kill a man and come back, you can't concentrate for a long time, maybe for a month, maybe for three months. It takes a long time to recover your normal pace, your normal speed of going through a book or your normal intensity of concentrating of attention. But if you kill a dog and come back, the recovery time is much less than the recovery time taken if you kill a man. Why? You have killed life in both cases. The reason being that this guilt arises from a feeling of life within this body and extinguishing of life in relation to the life in this body causes the guilt complex. And if the life is further removed in terms of consciousness from this body, the effect upon us is less. When we kill a human being, we feel we have killed ourselves and the impairment of the power to concentrate is much greater. When we kill a dog, the effect is less because the dog, in terms of awareness, does not come up to our level. But when we pluck an apple from a tree, the recovery time is very little. Because the degree of life in terms of the level of awareness is so much less that it detracts us only to a limited extent and there is a recovery period of much shorter duration in which we pick up again the power to concentrate. This is of great significance in the art of concentrating attention. Because if we have to subsist as living things upon other living things, then we must subsist on extinguishing that form of life which creates the least impairment of our power to concentrate. That is why the yogis in India and in the Orient generally have insisted upon a type of food which we take which should involve the lowest extinguishing of life. They call it the sattvic food. The food that least impairs your power to concentrate. I would consider that in the methodology of meditation, the kind of food we take is of great importance. And I would recommend a very simple, light, possibly bland, vegetarian, strictly vegetarian food would be the least detrimental to our capacity to concentrate our attention. In 1960, I had an opportunity to meet the Dalai Lama, the temporal and spiritual god of the Tibetan Buddhists. And I spent two years with him and we had wonderful discussions on meditation. He had two tutors, a senior tutor and a junior tutor. They believed that killing impairs the capacity to concentrate. But they did not believe that the eating of killed food could so impair the power to concentrate. Therefore, there was a little discussion with me 
and His Holiness the Dalai Lama insisted that so long as somebody else has killed the animal, the cow, the goat, whose meat he consumes, this burden of carrying the guilt and therefore impairing the power to concentrate must be borne by the one who killed, not by the one who ate the food, because the food consumed did not involve killing. I tried to use many arguments, and generally arguments are of no avail learning the art of meditation. I have discovered that through long years that you don't learn about yourself through arguments. In fact, if you are determined not to be yourself, if you are determined not to meditate, argue and argue hard, you will be sure to succeed. All I suggested to the Dalai Lama, who is the Tibetan head and remarkable in his knowledge and experience of the nature of mind, his scholarship was immense. And when he and I discussed the nature of the human mind, it was amazing that there was so much knowledge possible. When we discussed the concept of the shun, emptiness, and the mahashun, the greater emptiness, it was remarkable that such knowledge is even possible to put in words. And yet he had a hard time accepting that vegetarian food was necessary in order to retain the power to concentrate. I therefore said, Your Holiness, I will not argue any more, nor will I discuss. I will suggest a very simple experiment. He used to meditate for eight hours a day. He was a young man at that time. He had been exiled, had to run away from his home country, and had run from his palace in Lhasa, in the Tibet, to India. I happened to be a government functionary at that time. It became my duty to house him and to arrange an ashram for him. That is how I spent a couple of years with him. I suggested to him that you practice your meditation for one month on strict vegetarian food, the kind I am suggesting, and one month on meat foods. And then yourself tell me if there is a difference. He agreed, being a practitioner. Meanwhile, I was transferred from that station and went away to the state capital of the state of Punjab in India. After two months, he came all the way to meet me and to say he had become a vegetarian. And he said he became a vegetarian purely out of experience. He discovered that he would have concentrated much faster with the time he was giving to meditation if he had taken care of this. Then, of course, he was in a different mood. And he said, how come when we have not killed, we still have the guilt of killing? And I explained to him that the food we eat carries with it all the association of how it has come. In fact, I told him that the vibrations in matter arising out of energy in matter can be experienced by a sensitive consciousness at any time. If food is not properly cooked, if vegetables are cooked by a person who is mad, those vegetables get the vibration of that ill temper. If food is cooked with love and devotion, it is an aid to meditation. I am pointing out these things to tell you there is a lot of external preparation which is required before we can explore even our physical self. When we want to explore the physical self, which is called the pind, pind means the physical body and is distinguished from the and, which means the astral or the sensory body. The capacity to have sensory perceptions is held within this shell and is called the and. And the mental processes which give rise to wisdom, which give rise to intellect, reason, thinking, willing, ego, all those processes of consciousness are held in the creative function within which is called Brahmand. And there is our own totality, infiniteness, infinite consciousness, which transcends the individuated Brahmand, which we call such Khand. These are names being given. I'll give you the English translations. It's no use getting hung up on any oriental term. Once we know what they mean, the important thing is to know what we are doing. The consciousness of the physical body can be expanded into awareness of every bit of this physical body. 
we can travel into every little molecular atom of this physical body through the simple process of taking our concentrated attention along that path. We have the capacity to sharpen the focus of attention and instead of attending to something outside, attend to your own self within. When we explore this physical body, we find it a strange combination of many things. It has got several energies in it which attract our attention. We are prone to think this is merely flesh and bones and muscle and all that and we take it something as material. But when it functions, when this matter is held together in a strange equilibrium, we discover that there are strange patterns and pressures of energy which hold this physical frame together. And a study of that energy pattern in the physical body gives great joy, happiness and tremendous experience which we are not used to outside. By the simple device of withdrawing attention from external experience and placing it upon the vital energy within this physical body, we are capable of discovering a source of experience that we were unaware of. These energies function throughout the body. In every spot, in every speck of this body, those energies function. But they seem to radiate from different parts of the body. They seem to perform all this vital function, the function of life, the function of vitality, vital energy. They seem to perform those functions in a beautifully organized way. And that organization seems to consist of certain points at which our consciousness seems to be naturally located. For example, I am now talking to you and you are listening to me. If I were to suggest to you to contemplate, think, consider, where are you as a conscious entity located in this house, in this room called the physical body? A question similar to the one I could put to you, where are you sitting in this room with these walls outside? You would say, you are sitting in this corner or in the middle or there, depending upon where your body is placed. In the same way, I suggest to you to tell me, where are you sitting as a conscious entity in this physical body? Where do you feel you are in terms of a unit of consciousness? When you examine this question of mine and contemplate and consider, where am I as the conscious questioner? As the one who is asking this question, where am I? You get an answer. You are somewhere up here. You know you are experiencing the hands and the feet and the arms and the trunk and the head. Everything is being experienced. But experience from where? Where do you think you are? Where do you feel you are? At any point of time, you find that you are at a different place. In this wakeful state in which we sit, with each other now, we feel we are somewhere up in the head, somewhere behind the eyes. When we close our eyes and we imagine that we are conscious selves and not the body, we feel we are behind the eyes. When we want to think, consider, function in consciousness, we think, consider and function from here. If we want to think deeply, we put our hand here, not on the knee, not on the shoulder. Why? Because we have the feel that we are conscious entities, conscious beings operating from behind the eyes. When we close our eyes, we are conscious of the eyes being in front of us. If we are a one-pointed consciousness and we close our eyes and sit in meditation, sit in quiet, we discover that we have the eyes in front of us. What happens when we go to sleep? We are not conscious of the eyes in front of us. What are we conscious of? Well, we so quickly lose consciousness of the whole physical body that we can't relate our consciousness in sleep to any particular part of the physical body. But we can do so in half sleep. When we are in the process of descending into the sleep level, we can catch up and say, where are we? Each one of you can perform this experiment. When you are half asleep, when you are feeling drowsy, and you are falling off asleep, and you then do the same thing, and say, where are you? 
and you try and touch you, yourself where you are. You will not touch here on the forehead, which you do now. You will touch at the nose, at the tip of the nose. You will feel in the physical body when you are half asleep, even when you are in the process of sleeping, you will feel that what is in front of you are not the eyes anymore, but the tip of the nose. In fact, you are descending in your focal point of a feel of where you are, from a point behind the eyes to a point that is descending down. If you could find a methodology of holding your awareness up and yet having the experience of sleep, you would find that in the sleep state, you really descend in the feel of where you are from the focal point behind the eyes, down to the tip of the nose, down below, up to the throat. And all dream sequences happen when you are really feeling you are in the throat. If you could wake up at that time and want to touch here, you will touch here. You can try it. When you are in a kind of sleep which is called deep sleep, the, the dreams of which are not remembered, you move down from here into the region, in the cardiac region. When we wake up, we reverse this process. This business we are doing every night without being aware of it. We are using a certain part of, our, of this physical body, a center, as it were, in the physical body, which sustains different levels of consciousness. The wakeful state being here, the dream state being here, and the deep sleep state being here. There are more states than that. In deeper trances, in states of samadhi, we can take them even further down. It appears that this movement of a, of a notional point, of the notion of where we are, this notional point moves from a point behind the eyes all the way down. And it can move right up to the place where we sit, right up to our bottoms. And there seem to be several stages at which it can pause, generating different energy experiences, different experiences in awareness, different levels of experiences, different levels of consciousness. There are six clearly defined stages in this journey up and down, which we can perform and which we do perform. And each one of those stages holds the key to a type of energy which sustains a vital function of the hu human physical frame. The lowest, the rectal portion of the body, as we sit upon a place, holds that part of energy from which it seems that wishes arise, desires arise. In fact, we have associated that center of energy in the physical body with Lord Ganesh in India. A god, half man, half elephant, who is a story, I'm not going into the story, the temple of which God is placed at the entrance to, the, to most temples. So people have a worship of that God, seek wish fulfillment from that God before they go into an area of seeking higher awareness. Of course, many of these things have become symbolic, externalized. But the physical body contains this basic center at the bottom upon which we sit, upon which we rest. The second center from the bottom is at the reproductive organs. It is a creative center. All creative energy in the human being seems to function, flow from there. You will notice even the biological processes are relatable to these energy centers. And since it is a creative function in the pantheon of Indian gods and goddesses, we place the God Brahma, the creator, at that point, in the second center. The creator. The third center from the bottom is in the region around the navel, the region which holds the digestive mechanism, the region around which are the stomach, the liver, the intestines, and all that leads to sustenance of the system. Therefore, the Lord, the God of sustenance resides there whom we describe as Vishnu, the sustainer. In the, in the center above that, which is in the region around the heart, the cardiac region, the lungs, these are the functions in the physical frame which when they fail cause death. These have traditionally been accepted as the signs of death. When the heart stops and the lungs stop, you, you die. 
and they are both located in this region which is called the region of death and the Lord consciousness is held together. Not energy. Not energy of sustaining the physical systems. Not the energy that gives you awareness. But the entire conscious energy seems to flow from here. And this center has been called the center of the self. These are six vital centers. An exploration of the physical energy complex by a travel around these six centers through the process of meditation is a very, very rewarding experience. Is there anything which links in a, some kind of an express way something that connects these six centers? Is there something which flows all the way down and all the way up? There is one thing. That is the breath that we breathe. Because we can breathe through the nose, through the mouth, right up to the tip of the same point which I referred to earlier, from where it goes down, all into the lungs, diaphragms, presses down right up to the rectum. The air can flow all through. Breathing is of two kinds, but the Sanskrit word is the same. The Indian word we use for breath is one, it has two meanings. We call it prana. Prana means breath and also means breath of life. Breath is air. Breath of life is consciousness. We traverse both ways. Through air and through consciousness. We can extend consciousness along this breath as we can extend the air along the breath. When we are operating at the pinda level, the physical level, this physical breathing becomes very important and can relate our experiences to all the six centers. But when we withdraw further into the self to see how energy itself is functioning, what is the basis for the functioning of energy? We transcend these centers into a parallel set of another six centers called and. Those six centers have the same things but in their astral form, in a form in which they are the cause of these centers. These centers hold energy, those centers hold consciousness. We can rise from an experience of the physical self into an experience of our astral self. An experience of astral self means an experience of that part of the self which has the capacity to perceive through senses without the use of physical senses. We have the power to see when we open these eyes. But we also have the power to see in a dream. We also have the power to see in imagination. The power to see is identical in both cases. We see with these eyes or with other eyes. But seeing is the same thing. What constitutes seeing, hearing, not with these ears, not with these eyes, but seeing per se, hearing per se, feeling per se, touching per se, smelling per se. What constitutes that in human consciousness is called the astral body. Astral body is then the capacity to perceive through senses without the use of the physical body. We are not aware that we can develop through meditation the power to use our sensory mechanism, our sensory perceptions, without having to relate to the physical body. We then discover a very interesting thing. When we awake to that consciousness of ourselves, which is not tied down to an awareness of the physical body, we discover that we can see more than we could see with the eyes. These eyes can see what is before it. But the power to see in us can see anything. We were not using these eyes to see. We were using these eyes to block, limit seeing to what was before it. We were not, we can have the power to hear. Not that which is audible to this eardrum. Which is pretty little, precious little. But much more, infinitely more. The capacity to hear enlarges. And then we discover for the first time that this physical frame of ours was not an aid to seeing, hearing, touching and smelling, but was an obstacle to a full and free capacity to see, hear, touch, feel and have the sensory perceptions. That we have the capacity to do those things even without the use of the physical apparatus. 
meditation brings us directly not only into realization of that state but unleashes that state from the bondage from the cage of this physical system we can move anywhere some people call it astral projection nothing is projected what is projected is the capacity to perceive through senses without shifting the body a deeper meditation takes us beyond the and beyond the astral form beyond the sensory systems into our systems of pure mental perception from where our whole being seems to be created that part of the self in which resides our will our reason our intellect that part of the self in which all intellectual wisdom is confined from which all intellectual creativity comes the power to perceive directly mental perception we now think mind is merely a function of the body the brain through meditation through the technique of withdrawing our attention upon our own mind we can discover that part of the self which can perceive mentally without breaking up the experience into sensory functions we discover it is not necessary to see and hear separately in order to know a thing that we can indeed perceive a thing without having to see it and hear it separately this capacity of consciousness to be aware directly comes by withdrawing ourselves within our own mind the brahman part of the self we can transcend that part and get into the deepest self from which we can experience the highest awarenesses of man which in my view are love intuition beauty and joy mind and will do not give these nobody has intellectually experienced love or intuition or joy or beauty these are experiences that transcend the human mind we call them experiences of the soul and we understand by the soul that part of consciousness which transcends the intellect and is not bound down by time space frameworks in which intellect operates these are the timeless experiences which human consciousness is capable of at that level of withdrawal into oneself the capacity to withdraw attention is the same thing as the capacity to be ourselves because what have we done in the process we have merely shed these outer frames i am only drawing your attention to what happens when attention is withdrawn through meditation i must tell you at this stage that i sounds simpler than it actually is when you try to do the meditation because i am suggesting that you can withdraw attention as if it is a rope to be just pulled back it is not an easy rope which is just pulled back it is knotted up into too many strings and too many knots all over we have knotted it up in our relationships and you want to see the knots in meditation we see each one of those knots it is very interesting in our day to day life outside we forget the knots we have tied up in meditation they all come clearly before us when we want to withdraw attention to ourselves all the things we could never remember are suddenly up in memory before us when the mind tries to be there where it ought to be it thinks of the most far out things it has ever experienced the thinking process which seems to be so quiet seems to become loud fast and violent when we try to meditate the most difficult part of consciousness which comes in the way of withdrawing our attention to ourselves is the thinking process because it is through thoughts that we have projected ourselves most outside and scattered attention we can run away from the world go up on the top of the himalayas sit in a cave there and say we have renounced the world but how can we prevent the thoughts going again back to the same world you can sit up in a cave out in the snow and your mind can still go into the into the market and still eat a pizza out there <laughs> you can't stop it because the thought can't be stopped then you can't run away from the world by physically removing yourself you have to withdraw your thoughts 
and they are the most difficult to withdraw. So when I talk of the meditational methods, I want to draw special attention to the manner in which we have to handle our thoughts. These thoughts come to us in words because we have been trained to think in words. Words are phonetic symbols, sound symbols, which have association of ideas. Each symbol has been used to create an association with an experience. Every time that word is used, our mind, our attention, our conscious attention goes into that experience in memory lane. Words mean what we have experienced with those words. And therefore, every time thoughts come in conscious dream, they take us away into the experiences which those words indicate. We are scattered all the time by the use of thoughts. Then what is the technique of handling this problem? The technique involved is called Sumiran. Repetition of other words. Substitution of thought words by other words. Mantra. Use of some other words to replace the thought words. Use of such words which should not have the association of ideas which take our thoughts outside. A mantram is a word or a set of words designed to squeeze out from the thought stream words which take us out. By repeating the words of the mantram, we prevent our attention from going outside through the channel of the thought stream. Repetition of words then is a very important part of meditational technology. When we repeat words, we should be careful to repeat those words which do not have association of ideas. If we repeat any words, they mean that which we learned from those words. It is much better, therefore, to have words which we have not learned to mean anything outside. Mantrams are different words because they are not words having association of ideas outside. Any word cannot be a mantram. They must be words which withdraw us instead of scattering us. Or they should be such words which should have association of ideas with our, with our self. If they associate with the self within, then they will draw us to the self. Either they should be bland words or they should be words drawing us to ourselves. And such words have been called the mantra. And they cannot be coined or evolved by you because whatever you coin and evolve becomes a word with association of ideas. They are given invariably by a teacher. The one who teaches you meditational technique must tell you what mantra to repeat. A little technical point I must make at this stage. When we use the mantram to fight out thoughts, one of the major problems is that we are repeating the words of the mantram, but the thoughts keep on coming in. And we forget the repetition. And then we say, oh, you thoughts coming in, get out. And we start all over again. Then the thought comes again and distracts us. And we fight that thought and battle with it and turn, in, turn it off. Then we start all over again. The entire period, entire session of meditation, of repetition of mantram can be consumed in a continuous battle with thoughts. And after the session, we feel weak and tired and do not feel rewarded. I am giving you a practical tip on this subject. Why have we felt tired? Because we won every battle with the mind. All the thoughts that the mind brought in, we won every battle by turning it out. Then why should we have felt tired? The reason was that this distracting mind, this mind that was scattering our attention, was not interested in winning the battle. It was interested in engaging us, the self, in the battle, which it succeeded. Every time we thought we won the battle, by squeezing the thought out and starting all over again, in winning each battle, we lost the war. Because the mind's game the distracting attention's game was to keep the battles on, not to win them. Therefore, one has to know a very subtle technique of handling this problem. And that technique is to be diplomatic with the thoughts. Do not quarrel with the thoughts. 
diplomatically, in a relaxed way, in a beautiful way, like you would handle a difficult child with love and affection, cajoling it, bring it round to repeat the words which you are using. There is an art of doing it. You will notice that you can repeat mantram pretty loudly in your head, if you wish to. You should. But when you repeat the mantram loudly in your head, mentally, you also discover that the mind then becomes a commentator upon what you are doing. Mark that. You will notice that as you repeat the mantram in your meditative practice, there seems to be another voice commenting, saying, now you are doing right. Maybe it's too fast. Maybe you should slow down. Who is that? Because you are busy repeating the mantra. And who is that speaking in you? You can hear it. We all hear it. That is also the mind. The same mind which distracts. The thoughts do not come in one channel. The thoughts in human consciousness flow in a succession of channels. Sensitive meditators have been able to discover that when you meditate by repeating words in one channel, the scattering thoughts jump up to the next higher level and become commentators upon that channel. When you try to control that channel, they jump up to the third. Up to eight channels have been identified by sensitive meditators. But not more than three or four bother the average practitioner of meditation. How do we control this business? What is the technology of bringing our thoughts back to the bland words, the mantram, which we are using? The technology is to repeat the mantram in chorus. Use each channel. Don't worry about the commentator. Ask him to join. And don't start all over again. Ask him to join at the point at which you are doing the repetition of the mantram at the lowest level. When you try and plug all these channels, then the mind assumes another distracting attitude, a stance. That is called, the image of somebody else will come. Your wife, your husband, your friend, somebody will appear and start speaking in that voice. And you think you are doing a pretty good job because you are doing your job that someone else speaking. It's in your mind. The mind finding that you have been able to control it, keep it in strict discipline in that level, tries to take that form. The technique of dealing with that situation in meditation is to let that figure join you in the meditation. The whole business is to have a chorus of repetition so that the sounds of the bantram become so loud, full, covering every channel, every figure, every image, and the thoughts are squeezed out. It takes time and practice, but it works at the higher levels of realization of the self. You discover that this process of concentration is no longer necessary because you become so aware of that conscious experiencer within you, it is such a new experience that that experience can hold you in. The holding of yourself within yourself, being yourself without an aid, is called the art of placing the attention upon the self. It has also been referred to as the Surta Shabda Yoga. The capacity of putting Surta, attention, upon the Shabda or consciousness. The capacity to invert attention into consciousness. The capacity to listen to your own self. The capacity to see the resonance, vibration of your own self. To reside in your own vibration without external props and aids. The external props and aids of mantras and repetitions and capacity to perceive through all the centers, they all aid you to reach a stage when you must then adopt the technology of inverting, reversing attention to your own vibrating self. To listen to your own resonance. The ultimate conscious process involved in being yourself is the process of listening. Even now, we are basically listeners. 
and the listening part of consciousness rather than the speaking part of consciousness becomes the basic instrument of meditation. How do we perceive things now? Let us imagine, Steve, this class. Supposing your mind did not comment upon what you are doing in terms of sense perceptions, you do not perceive. It's a strange thing but true. Basically, consciousness is a listener. And when it listens to itself, it listens to its own resonance, its own vibration. At that stage, you begin to discover, in fact, at an earlier stage in meditation, you begin to discover that the repetition of the mantra is not being done by you. It's only when we are pulling ourselves from outside to within ourselves that we have the task of repeating ourselves. As we grow in this exercise, we discover that it is our mind as an entity within consciousness which repeats the mantram and we are listeners. The expert meditators, they sit quietly and listen to their mantra. You don't have to speak or repeat, you merely have to listen. So ultimately, when the greatest realization of the self comes, it comes through the art of listening to oneself. Either in words to start with, or with the essential resonance or vibration that comes eventually. And these distractions which occur in the early part disappear. That capacity to listen to oneself generates the capacity to love, the capacity to feel oneness. Because for the first time you have experienced oneness with yourself. And that's part of self which is consciousness. Having experienced it once, you open your eyes and see the world and you discover how the world is being sustained by the same consciousness. That if you are not conscious, there will be no world. You discover the creative power of consciousness in the entire world and you feel one with that world. You love the whole world thereafter, and you can't help it. One experience of being with one's real self gives you an everlasting experience of being one with everyone, because they all seem to be, look like, experience like part of one, being part of consciousness. This then is the approach to meditation. I have given you this general review of the meditational process and the techniques that come. I have not exhaustively covered. Every step of meditation involves a large system of methodology to deal with our individual problems. The techniques change as we change in our level of awareness. And finally, we find the only technique left is the technique of oneness, of love, of union, unity. Thank you. Our minds World peace will be a natural phenomenon. It is only the cover of the mind that creates division, aggression, war and violence. If we keep on destroying ourselves the way we are, the rest of us who survive must have peace. <laughs> In that way, we seem to be making peace quite inevitable. Uh, you will be little uh, surprised to find, if you haven't heard it before, that this is the description of the soul in most religions, not only in Christianity. And most of the time when we talk of what happens to a physical consciousness when it dies in the physical body and we refer to certain disembodied experiences, we are referring only to that level of conscious experience or, or astral body. We go no beyond that. The same thing I said also when I said one word has two meanings in Sanskrit. Prana means the living spirit or consciousness as much as it means the death. And these are used in the same sense. In fact, the pranayam, the system of breath control or using attention upon breath is with reference to breath physically and breath as consciousness. Because what links our state of being now with our highest states of being or God is the breath of consciousness. That's the link. Consciousness is the link between man and God. Therefore, there is no difference. And uh, my con concept of God is total consciousness. 
a concept that fits in with all religious traditions throughout the world a concept that satisfies the criteria we have given to god omnipotent omnipresent omniscient i am not aware of any other description definition understanding of god that fits in with those qualities 